Good evening. Um, thanks for joining us faithfully. You know, uh, it's hard to find faithful people. Now, if you would just listen to me, it's very difficult to find faithful people uh, all around. But, you know, it is amazing to see you joining on uh, Friday nights. Uh, I know there are so many different things you would want to do on Friday nights, but you managed to be here. And uh, I just want to praise God. <clears throat> and this topic of faithfulness of God is something that I treasure. I mean, like, every topic uh, seems like I'm saying that, but this is one attribute that I would, I would want to trust God more and love Him more. He is faithful. He's unchanging. And He always carries out. So, uh, as we are uh, finishing up this Exodus 34, 6 self-proclamation of Yahweh, God Himself, uh, where He said, The Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and today we'll be dealing with faithfulness. Now we're done with four, uh, Lord willing, and then next week we're going to finish up this great, uh, great statement in Exodus 34. Tonight, uh, I want us to begin with a verse that I treasure all my life. And the verse is from Lamentations chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. The steadfast love of the Lord, has it, never ceases. And His mercy, Rahum, never come to an end. But they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Did you hear that? Great is thy faithfulness, the Bible says. If you know the context of this Lamentations, it's even more amazing. It's when... It is written when Babylon, the superpower of that time, came and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. It was something that was uh, foretold and prophesied. And finally, uh, the entire superpower, this mighty army came in and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And there, was, there were death everywhere, hunger everywhere. You, can you imagine? Basically, hell broke loose, hopeless. And that's when Jeremiah, remembering Hesed, remembering Rahum, and he said, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Let's begin with the word faithfulness. Uh, we're going to look into Greek and Hebrew uh, because we've been talking about Hebrew word. Uh, the word for uh, faithfulness is emet or amuna, and it stems, to, uh, it stems from the meaning of, listen to this, two things, carrying a child and caring a child. It stems from uh, the meaning of caring, sort of like the strength, supporting activity, uh, and then caring a child. Caring a child. So one, it had, one is like a father's role, and the other one is like sweet mother's role. Supporting, carrying a child with his mighty arms, and then carrying a child. And from there, we have the meaning of firmness, stability, and faithfulness, and get this, and truthfulness. Hebrew word amet has a uh, sort of like dual meaning for uh, English speakers like you and I. Uh, faithfulness and truthfulness is slightly different, but in Hebrew meaning, it's the same. Now, if you think about it, because he is faithful to his word and promise and all that he does, his word is truthful. So truthful and faithful is the same word. Now, when we come to the Greek word uh, in Septuagint, again, that's the uh, Greek translation of the Old Testament, 
uh, Septuagint renders two words, pistos, faithful, pistos, and then eletheia, which means uh, truthful. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? The truth and uh, faith is one word in Hebrew and Greek. So when we say of the faithfulness of God, it can be defined as, now listen to this definition, his determined loyalty to a gracious covenant. I'm going to repeat this again because I'm going to use this uh, definition again and again tonight. It's God's determined, it's God's, God's determination, God's determined loyalty. Wow, isn't that amazing? He's determined to be loyal to his people. Have you? See? He has determined to be loyal, determined loyalty to a gracious covenant. I think two words kind of stands out. One is determined loyalty. Hesed love. And he has determined to be loyal to his people. And the other one is gracious covenant. A covenant is an agreement or a contract. And now think with me. God makes a contract or agreement with you. That's grace. That's grace. That in and of itself is grace. Okay? So it's his determined loyalty to a gracious covenant. So in the Old Testament, faithfulness is frequently linked with hesed. It's like copular, linking verb, okay? Steadfast love, and then there is faithfulness. Hesed and emet, they go together, and it has a very special bond between these two words. And one of the best examples of God's hesed or faithfulness is when God promised to betroth Mary, to Mary, his unfaithful northern kingdom of Israel. That's the book of Hosea. Did you catch that? God promises to betroth or marry unfaithful, harlot-like, adulterous wife, northern uh, kingdom of Israel. Okay? Hosea 2.19 says, And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth, to you, betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, as you shall know the Lord. It's an amazing promise, isn't it? I'm going to marry you, I'm going to marry you, I'm going to marry you forever. To whom? To unfaithful, adulterous, northern Israel, his wife. Okay. I'm going to betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know me. Yada. We heard that word last Sunday. That's the word. That the Lord knows the way of righteous. In Psalm, uh, uh, Psalm 1, verse, verse 5, and God promised that, promises that you shall yada the Lord. You, you shall know, know the Lord. So we see God's determined Loyalty to a gracious covenant. Faithfulness is an attribute of God. And we've been saying this all along. Any attribute of God, it's safe to add infinitely. He's infinitely faithful. Perfectly faithful. Which is an amazing statement. Okay? Which, uh, therefore... The uh, Bible says his works are faithful, Psalm 33, verse 4. His judgment have been appointed in faithfulness, okay? And his path are faith, faithfulness, Psalm 25, verse 10. All the path of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. For those who keep his covenant and his testimonies, all his, his ways for you and I are his faithfulness. Not only that, his afflictions are given in faithfulness. Psalm 119, verse 75. His re re compasses return are faithful. Isaiah 61, verse 8. And his plans are faithful. Everything he does, 
is faithful to his people. Okay? His works, his judgment, his path, his afflictions, he recompenses, and his plan for his people. Okay? What about in the New Testament? Is God any different? What does New Testament say about the faithfulness of God? Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1.9, listen to this, God is faithful, pistos, faithful, by whom we are called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? God's faith, faithfulness, pistis, pistis, which is a noun form, continued from the Old Testament, and that is His determined loyalty to gracious covenant with his people, okay? He's determined to be loyal and to his gracious covenant with his people. And it clearly, ultimately, fully shown uh, his faithfulness uh, in the cross and the resurrection of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that today. Always, always, right? In Christ. It should be noticed that, also in the New Testament, as we already mentioned, the word truth and faithfulness are interchangeable, used interchangeably. Oftentimes, the word emet is translated into faithfulness or sometimes just aletheia, truthfulness. So interesting. Here's an example. Now, this will make you uh, think a little bit. In John 1.17, it says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth, eletheia, came through Jesus. Hmm. How is that related to faithfulness? Grace and truth came through Jesus. That sounds like hesed and emet came through Jesus. Okay? Those of you are following. All right? <clears throat> Let us consider faithfulness of men. We just talked about faithfulness of God. What about the faithfulness of men? God's loyalty to His covenant demands loyalty and faithfulness from His people. That's you and I. Okay, and that's, that's fair. He's loyal to you, and He's committed to you, and He demands loyalty and faithfulness from His people. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. And this is the rem uh, reminder of the heart of the law. And God speaks to his people. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. The faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his com uh, commandments to a thousand generation. He expects his people to be faithful. However, we human beings are not capable of being faithful. We're not. Why? Because we were born with this sin-rebellious nature. Now we're coming to uh, New Testament teaching in the book of Romans. Therefore, we are disobedient and rebellious at the core. At the core. Romans 1 uh, through chapter uh, 1 through th uh, 3 talks about that. That is in our DNA, and that is our bent, inclination, or disposition. It is not that we sin, therefore we become a sinner, but we, are, uh, we, we sin because we were born as sinners. Did you catch that? We do not become a sinner because we sin since birth, but we uh, cannot help but to sin because we were born as sinners. Okay? In fact, we love to sin. We love it. Without grace of God and intervention of God, uh, we love to sin and we reaped the harvest of sin. Okay? And Romans just kind of sums up like this. Therefore, no one seeks God. No one knows God. And no one understands God. No one is good, not even one. No one can truly obey Him and be faithful to Him or to anybody else. Therefore, we are in desperate need of salvation. 
That's why we need a Savior or Redeemer. Why? Because the consequence and the penalty of that sinful life, sin nature life, in, uh, to the holy God is death and death eternal. And that's, the, that's like the framework of the Bible, isn't it? So what does God do for this unfaithful, incapable of being faithful, loyal, and uh, constantly betraying, rebellious, hopeless, and helpless people like you and I and his people? What does he do? That's the story of the Bible, isn't it? Okay? So we come to quickly to Gospel Connection. And the uh, rest of the uh, hour, we're going to just talk about one chapter, Genesis 15. Genesis 15. It's very unlikely place to hear the Gospel Connection, but that's an amazing chapter. Genesis 15, where God makes a covenant with Abram. Okay, this is Abram, not Abraham, before his name changed. Okay, and what does it mean to make a covenant? Covenant is like a contract for our contemporary people, uh, people's understanding. It's like a contract or an agreement. So God is making a contract agreement or a covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. Hebrew expression or Hebrew word for making a covenant is cut a covenant. Did you catch that? It's cut a covenant. And there, uh, the, the reason will be explained. Why? Because our God has determined to make a covenant with his people. Why is he doing that? Because he's determined to. That's his mercy. That's his hesed. That's who he is. He's determined to make or cut a covenant with his people. And that's grace. We already talked about that. Not only he's determined to cut a, gov a covenant, but he is loyal to his covenant. Loyal to his covenant. Okay? So Abram, after many years passed uh, since Genesis 12, when first God called him, Right? And God has promised Abram, basically, I'm going to make a great nation. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. So he promises two things. Number one, you're going to have, to have many, many children, many, many descendants. Okay? Even, there is, uh, um, even if you have so many people, if you don't have the land, you cannot become a nation. So he promises two things. You're going to uh, you're going to have many, many descendants, and I'm going to give you a land, land of Canaan. But Abram waited, 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 but he doesn't have a single child. Can you picture that? God promised that you're going to have, promised, promised to Abram that you're going to have like a descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. But after, he waited years, but he doesn't have one child. That's where Genesis 15 picks up, okay? Abram was kind of like uh, edgy and kind of complaining to God, suggesting a different idea, okay? Maybe I'm going to use my uh, servant, Eliezer. He's going to be my heir. So he was suggesting a plan B to God. And then God said, no, 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 no. You're going to have your own child out of your own body. And then verse 5 says, he, uh, God brought him outside and said, Look, look toward heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Okay. Many years ago, I went to Sudan, uh, southern Sudan. And uh, it was late in the evening uh, where they have no electricity of whatsoever. So we started to have dinner around, I don't know exactly, 6 o'clock. And then we were just sitting there talking in uh, like, an, like an African culture. 
We were talking, 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 and it was getting dark, and I didn't even know, right? And then uh, the pastor, African pastor, Sudanese pastor, asked me to, why don't you look up, pastor? So I looked up. And you know what I saw? A Milky Way. You would not believe what I saw. You could literally see millions of stars, millions of stars. I just looked up. I was like, wow, so many stars. Okay. God told Abram, look, can you count the stars? You're going to have children, your descendants, as many as those. To that, Abraham believed the Lord, and God counted it to him as righteousness. That's Genesis chapter 15, verse 5. That's a famous verse. God counted that faith as righteousness. Okay, we're not going to talk much about that right now because we want to go to the covenant part. So, the children are taken care of. Now, what about the land? What about the land? Verse 7. So, Abraham said to God, uh, excuse me, God said to Abraham, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of Chaldean to give you this land to possess. So, in other words, God promises that, you know, I'm going to give you land. Do you realize I've shown you grace? Election grace. That's why I, I, I took you out from Ur of Chaldean, which is near uh, Mesopotamia, where current Iraq is. You know, Abraham wasn't even a Jew. Did you know that? Why was Abraham chosen? There is no reason given whatsoever. Only thing we know about Abraham, his father was an idol worshiper. That's the only thing we know. But God, God said, you know, I am the Lord who brought you out from the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But this is Abraham's response. But Abraham said to, to God, O Lord God, how do I know that? How shall I possess it? So could you give me a proof? Okay. That's when God did something very, very peculiar. Listen to this. God told Abraham, okay, a strange thing. Bring me a heifer that is three years old. Heifer is a young female cow. Bring me a cow. And, and then uh, a female goat, which is three years old. One cow, one goat, and a pigeon, okay? And then you cut them in half. Now, can you picture with me? There's a cow, young cow, three-year-old. I don't know how, how big, you know, Israeli cow is, but got to be pretty big. Can you imagine cutting in half? Which way? Sagittal cut? Transverse cut? Coronal cut? I don't know, but cutting in half. Oh, and female goat, cutting in half. Sagittally, coronally, transversely, I don't know. You just cut it in half. Okay. And lay each half over against each other. So in other words, kind of put the left here, one half, and the other and the other, the other half. Can you picture, picture with me? Can you imagine how bloody that is? How messy that is? How gross that is? Cutting the animal in half. And God told Abraham, sort of like, Abraham, listen to me. You know, you don't have a child right now, but I'm going to tell you your future. And this is what's going to happen. Your offsprings will be slaves and will be afflicted for 400 years. What is he talking about? The nation of Israel, isn't it? Right? In Egyptian slavery. But you know what? I'm going to deliver them out of, uh, out of them. By my mighty power, I'm going to redeem them. God begins to speak about future. And Abraham has no idea. No idea. Okay? And now the actual 
covenant or cutting of the covenant uh, ritual between God and Abraham, which is an amazing, amazing thing. Now stay with me, okay? This is the site. Verse 15, 17. When the sun had gone down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passes between the pieces of that halved cow, goat, and pigeon. Okay? There is that a smoking, uh, smoking fire pot passing between this halved animals that is blood all over the place. Okay? And verse 18 says, On that day, Lord, Yahweh, cut a covenant with Abraham, saying to your offspring, I'm going to give you this land. You know what he's doing? I swear. I am making an oath. I am making an agreement. I am signing a covenant with you that I'm going to give you this land. That's what he's doing. Hmm. What is going on? Okay. Let me explain, okay? First of all, in uh, ancient Near East, that is the way of making or cutting a covenant. They would have the animals. They cut the animal in half, okay? And between the two parties, you're, you and I are making uh, a contract, and we would walk, and you would walk. I would walk, and you would walk, okay? Basically, that means, the meaning is, if I break the covenant, that I just signed, if I betray, if I be disloyal to this covenant that I'm making with you, see those animals? What happened to those animals will happen to me. That's the way to make a covenant, cutting a covenant. So both parties were agreeing to keep and to be faithful to the promise or the covenant. Do you follow? However, if you look at Genesis 15, just a couple of things just kind of stands out. It just doesn't look right. Okay? Let me point them out, out to you. First of all, covenant takes two parties. Right? Two parties agreeing, making an agreement or a contract. But if you read Genesis 15, the covenant was cut by both parties, but I only see God in theophany of smoking fire pot. That's God in theophany, which is in a visible uh, uh, manifestation of invisible God. Fire, uh, uh, smoking fire pot, passing through it. And he is cutting a covenant. But what about Abram? I don't see any Abraham doing that. Second thing is, if you would think with me, God cuts the covenant, covenant with Abraham. And my question is, why? Why? He already made a promise to him, and he's truthful, and he is saying, basically, if I do not keep my promise, if I am not faithful to you, I'm going to cut myself. I'm going to place that curse upon me. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? Which foreshadows the cross. Doesn't it? I'm going to do that. If I were to break and betray and disloyal and be unfaithful to this covenant, I'm going to cut myself and I'm going to place that curse upon myself and I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be put to death. That's God's self-maledictory act of God. The word malediction is the opposite of benediction. What does that word mean, benediction? Blessings, right? So what's malediction? Curse. God placed curse upon himself, which is an... Amazing statement. So why does God do this? Because he is 
Yahweh, faithful God, covenant loving God. He has determined to make covenant and to be loyal to it. Okay? What's the reason? Because He is Yahweh. That's who He is. What happened to the covenant? What happened to the covenant between God and Abram? It's pretty disastrous, isn't it? It was pretty disastrous. Throughout history, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament and throughout human history, the descendants of Abraham, Israelites, and human beings, we broke the covenant. Unfaithful. Acted in wickedness. Betrayal. Disloyal. Unfaithful. Idolatrous. Adulterous. Disobedient. And rebellious. That's what happened. So what should happen to us? We should be cut in halves. We should be cut in halves. What about God? What about God? What did he do on his part? In spite of our unfaithfulness and our disloyalty, he has been loyal to his covenant. He, did, he has determined to be loyal to his gracious covenant. Right? He was even slow to anger. Remember we talked about that? Erek apayim. Long-suffering. Just, just, just forbearing his wrath upon his people. And he waited, he waited, and he waited until the fullness of time. And then what happened? In the fullness of time, Yahweh, God himself, sent or he came to us, into our history. Why did he come? To cut a covenant. That's why he came. He came to cut another covenant, which is the replacement of the old, because the old one has been broken. It was the new covenant of the blood, of the lamb, <laughs> and he came to cut a uh, came to cut a covenant. Covenant. Hebrews chapter two, verse seventeen. Listen to this. Therefore, Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect. He became a human being, so that Jesus might become a listen merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation. For the sins of the people. It's an amazing statement. Yahweh himself was sent or he came, right? Jesus came so that he may be a high priest. High priest. Not just any high priest, but he's merciful and he's faithful. You know what? He came because of his amet, faithfulness. What should happen to the people who's been breaking the covenant over and over and over again? They should be cut in half, put to death. But he came. Why? For God and for his people. Right? Jesus is Yahweh, the great I Am, and he was the high priest who is merciful and faithful to offer sacrifice to God. That's the role of a high priest. Now, the interesting thing is, Jesus, not only he's the high priest, but he is the sacrifice himself. Right? He's the animal that was cut in half. And remember, it's supposed to be the people. It's supposed to be you and I. It's supposed to be his people that should be put to death, cursed, and uh, cut in half. But he's a merciful, infinitely merciful God. So for his people, in place of his people, he was cursed. 
So he was cut in half on Calvary. And he cut the covenant, a new covenant. That's the new covenant, isn't it? You know, our God is a faithful God. So I always believed, those of you who knew me for years, we are called to be faithful people. Can you imagine doing anything with someone who is not faithful? Sports, business, how about building a church? Can you build a church with unfaithful group of people? What would be an opposite uh, word or antonym to faithfulness? Don't say unfaithfulness, unfaithful. How about disloyal? How about fickle? How about betrayal? This would be the opposite of faithfulness. We are called to be faithful people of God. Okay? Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 says, And the angel of the church in Laodicea wrote, listen to this amazing statement, the words of Amen. That's Jesus with capital A. Okay? Amen means truthful, truth, truly. The words of Amen, the faithful and true witness. In other words, Jesus is Amen. Can you say Amen? You should love to say Amen. Can you say Amen? Yeah. In your worship services, you should say Amen. That's Jesus' name. He's truthful. Not only He's truthful, He's faithful. And He's the true witness. Friends, He abides in us. Friends, He was united with us through Calvary. That's the new covenant that was cut on Calvary. His Spirit lives in us. We are called to be faithful, truthful, and we can and we will live as true witness of this faithful God. That's our calling. Can we live this? Absolutely. I really do believe that's what we become as we walk with Him. Just one more verse. Uh, this is about uh, when Christ returns, when everything will be consummated. It's in Revelations chapter 19, verse 11, when Christ returns. And this is the picture John kind of like drew, uh, drew for us. And this is the picture. Then I saw the heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True with capital F and capital T. And uh, his name is Faithful and True. You know who that is? That's our Lord, Jesus. His name is Faithful. His name is Amen. And his name is True, Eletheia. His That's his name. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to judge the world in righteousness and make war. That will be the consummation of God's determined loyalty to His gracious, gracious covenant. That's His faithfulness. That's His faithfulness. He will be returning on a white horse, and His name is Faithful, and His, faith, his name is True, and He will be judging the world in perfect righteousness. Okay, let's pray. Father, we are uh, so in awe. What an amazing story that is. God's determined loyalty to a a wretch like me and to his gracious covenant. Father, we thank you that 
you came and renew that covenant and recutting that covenant through the blood of your son Jesus Christ. Lord, I deserve to be there. I supposed to be the one who who uh, uh, supposed to be cut in half. But then you took that place on behalf of me, and you shed the blood for me, Lord. And I'm forever grateful to you, Father. I just pray that we will understand your loyal love and your faithfulness, O oh God, your hesed and your emet that flows out of you, Lord. And I just pray that you will give us hope to become more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for that gospel. We thank you for that faithful gospel of Jesus Christ. And we commit the rest of the evening unto you. And would you bless this hour. And we thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining.